You are listening to the Intelligent Vocalist Podcast, Episode 75. Welcome to the Intelligent Vocalist with John Henney. This is the podcast dedicated to help you be a smarter, better, more informed singer. And now, your host for the Intelligent Vocalist, John Henney. Hey there, this is John Henney. Welcome back to another episode of The Intelligent Vocalist. I do so appreciate you spending your precious time with me. So, my book, I am just a couple of days away from sending my very first book. And I've I've actually, uh, this is my third attempt. Uh, first one, didn't get very far. Second one, I actually finished, in, but I finished writing the first draft and then didn't go any further. I'll probably go back to that one. But uh, this one is on teaching contemporary singing. And I am just a couple of days away from sending it off to being formatted. I've had a number of people read it, test readers go through it. And the feedback that I've gotten has been uh, very encouraging. I'm just trying to tighten up some things, uh, a couple of redundant paragraphs, things like that. Uh, but it it looks like my goal of creating a book where a someone who's very passionate about singing has been studying singing and really wants to be able to share it with others by starting to teach. My goal of creating a guidebook um, looks like I've gotten pretty close, reasonably close, as close as you can get with a book. And I'm creating some online supplemental materials with some extra videos and downloads to help people absorb the material. There's a lot in there. I I really worked hard to try and make it easy to understand or at least as easy as possible. And I, I think I've done that to an extent. So I'm I'm getting really, really excited. Uh should have it back within about uh, a week, week and a half, and uh, getting ready to launch. I was hoping to get it sooner, but uh, some of the feedback I got, and and I appreciate uh, some of the critical feedback. I really do. Not as much fun to read as the positive, but I do appreciate it. And some of the critical pointed out, hey, this this is a little meandering here, a little confusing here. So I, I took the opportunity to clean that up, as well as uh, get some illustrations for the book, Uh, and the supplemental materials. I I don't want the book full of illustrations because you can certainly do that and and fill it with all kinds of scale patterns. And I'm putting that on a a website component just because uh, most people are going to get this on Kindle. And images just don't work all that well in Kindle. So I'm going to have like teaching scales and things available as downloads so people can print them out and uh, sit with their piano and study those and figure them out. But it it's really fascinating what's happened in publishing. Everybody's very aware of the revolution that's happened in music, uh, starting with Napster and LimeWire and now Spotify, et cetera, that's just blown open the doors uh, to anybody who wants to create content and get it out there. And uh, it's happening in the movie industry. Obviously, movies are much more expensive to create, but there are uh, better and better cameras that cost less and less money. And now there are content creators like Netflix and Amazon, and they've really kind of taken the legs out of the traditional Hollywood studios, the traditional gatekeepers. And it, what's been going on a little more quietly is what Amazon has done in the publishing space with not just the Kindle, but also with their uh, Create Space. I think they've recently changed the name, but uh, Create Space is their service where you can upload your book file and Amazon will list it on their site and just print it on demand and ship it off. Uh, for you. You don't have to do anything. And you get uh, worldwide distribution and Amazon essentially becomes your publisher. So the whole, the gatekeepers of publishing have dissolved. Uh, I mean, if you're, listen, if you're writing uh, the next Twilight and, or uh, you're a very famous author, uh, then yeah, traditional publishing obviously has its benefits, just like being on a major label does. But for some of you that feel like you have a book within you, there there are no more excuses. I mean, your publisher is you. It's there and it's available to you. 
little bit of a learning curve. I'm, I'm going through it. I've been sharing uh, what I'm going through uh, a bit with my email list. And speaking of, if you're interested in kind of uh, following my journeys, my, my basic thought dumps between these podcasts, uh, go to johnhaney.com and sign up for my email list. You'll see the little forms there peppered uh, throughout my um, website. And I've also got blogs there, and you can listen to, to back episodes of the podcast. I've got transcriptions of most of the episodes there. If you kind of like reading through what I'm talking about, you can search for different topics, etc. cetera. But uh, yeah, the, it's just amazing the time we are living in. And I keep saying I think we're in the golden age of technology, the, this little brief moment where it really is a helpful force in our lives before it turns around and destroys us all. And if you are following anything that's going on with artificial intelligence, uh, there is reason to be worried about what's coming down the pike. But, but for now, uh, the Terminators are not hunting us, so technology is a good thing. I mean, I'm able to put out uh, my teaching courses. Uh, when I first got started teaching, the only way to do that, it would be to, uh, you know, record and produce uh, packs of DVDs or compact discs. And now I've, I have a whole system that just basically holds all my videos and people can sign up and it's all delivered automatically. It's, it really is kind of thrilling and it's really fun for me. I've, I've really got a passion for uh, content creation. So I'm really happy. And uh, yes, I will be letting you know how to get my book uh, very, very soon. I plan on having some some specials where you can get it uh, extremely inexpensive. Some people have said this would be a great book for singers to read as well. That's not my intended audience. It, it really is for those looking to teach, but you'll learn a lot about the voice in the process. So jumping to today's topic, uh, do you have what it takes? That's such an such a loaded question. And it's one I, I get asked often as a voice teacher, I will have people come in and I'll, I'll have worked with them for five minutes and they'll say, do I have what it takes? Am I wasting my time? And I tell people, well, first of all, you're never wasting your time. If singing is never more than just a passion for you or a journey into learning something new and gaining a new skill, how could that ever be wasting your time? Uh, now, if you are looking to become the next uh, pop star, uh, some, some superstar, then that's a very, very different question. But that's also one that's extremely hard to answer because part of this whole journey of becoming an artist and becoming famous is a matter of certain dominoes falling into place. Luck is really a part of this. And yes, the harder you work, the luckier you will get. But I always go back to an interview I saw on television with uh, one of the very first supermodels. Her name was uh, Lauren Hutton, I believe. And she was talking about how she was very lucky to become such a famous model. And she said, you know, if I had been born a few years sooner, or just a few years later, I wouldn't have had this career. She said, my particular look was happened to be what was in fashion, what people were looking for when I came of the right age. And there's really nothing you can do about that. There are, there are certain factors that are out of your control that have to do with luck. The guitarist of The Police, Andy Summer, he wrote a book called One Train Later. And the title referred to the fact that he was a struggling musician. He uh, had moved to Los Angeles. And now that I'm telling this, I think I've told this on a podcast before, but it, it bears repeating uh, because this is, this is really important. Uh, but he, uh, he had moved back to the UK and he was doing some random gigs there. And he got on a train and he met, uh, I believe it was the, the drummer, Stuart Copeland of the police. It was either uh, Stuart or Sting. And they just happened to be looking for a guitarist to form their trio that became the police. And he said, you know, if I had taken one train later, 
This never would have happened for me. And that's something that he simply could not control. The, the career gods had to be smiling down on him. However, that does not mean he would not have had a satisfying career in music or it would not have taken away any of the, the, the passion that he has for music and his ability to create and connect with people. He just may not have done it uh, with a bigger audience or as big of an audience. However, if he had taken one train later, who knows? Well, I can't imagine uh, he could have been in a group bigger than the police at the time, but he could have met somebody else. Maybe he would have got into Duran Duran. Who knows? Um, but there is always that luck element in it. And you, you can't get obsessed with that. All you can do is focus on being the best singer you can be, the best musician you can be, the best songwriter you can be, and just really put your heart and soul into that and learning to eliminate fear, fear of judgment, fear of criticism, uh, and, and get your stuff out there. Uh, this book, as I, I can feel a little bit of fear creeping in uh, as I'm going over my last little edits and part of me doesn't want to let go because you see right now the book a uh, small group of people have read it I've gotten some good feedback and so in my mind in my experience the book so far has been a success but the people who have read it are people who know me on some level Maybe not personally, but they're members of my email list and, and they've kind of been warmed up to me. But when I put it out there into the cold, cruel world, there's going to be a different level of judgment. And quite frankly, I know that uh, some bad reviews are coming. And also, I know that you actually need a few bad reviews to, to, so that the good reviews look legitimate. I mean, if you look at a book and it has nothing but good reviews, it seems suspect. But I also know that um, it's a little tough when you read those. And so I'm just getting myself uh, mentally prepared and getting over that, that fear of criticism. And that's something that you need to get over as well as an artist. So this idea of do you have what it takes, nobody can really answer that. Because when you put your music out, even though there may be those even in, in the industry that may tell you uh, you don't have what it takes, it's up to the audience to decide. How many great artists, I mean, I just recently saw Bohemian Rhapsody and also just watched uh, the new A Star Is Born. And the theme of both uh, was Lady Gaga pushing against an industry, telling her that she didn't have the look, she didn't have what it takes. And of course, in the movie, I'm not spoiling anything, she does have what it takes. Bohemian Rhapsody, Queen trying to release that song and being told that, that radio won't play this and um, the, the song is a disaster. And it's now one of the most beloved songs of all time. It was a huge, huge hit. I remember hearing that come on the radio as a kid and just having my mind blown. I just instantly loved the song. But on paper, um, there's nothing about that song that should have made it successful. And I believe those in the record industry that told Queen releasing this song as a, as a single they were right based on prior experience. That's all they had to go on. Now, Queen had this vision that they could go beyond what had occurred before and create the success. But that song could have just as easily sank like a stone and no one would have remembered it. And certainly every amazing visionary artist has had works that they put out that just bomb, that go nowhere. Steven Spielberg has had movies that don't do well. Queen had singles that didn't do as well. Um, in their later years, they didn't sell as well in the U.S. Um, and some of that had to do with, uh, I think, some attitudes towards uh, Freddie's changing uh, persona. Uh, but that's a whole different discussion. But every artist uh, experiences failure. You can't know until you put it out there. And ultimately, uh, 
criticism is is only people judging you by what's come before not is what not what is to be and you can't know what is to be uh, you just have to be true to yourself now if you're getting the same consistent feedback um, same criticisms you may just want to stop and really look at what's going on um, there were a couple of things in my book where the the same criticism popped up a couple of times few times um, not everyone, but, but enough where I went, you know what, I need to stop and I need to go back and take a second look at this and make some adjustments. So all feedback is good, but it is never the final word. And the very stuff where I got some criticism, there were a couple of people who really liked that part of the book. Uh, but as I just looked at it with new eyes uh, gave myself a break from the book for a few days and came back to it, I decided that the the critics were right and I needed to make some adjustments. But there were other criticisms where I looked and thought, no, no, I'm, I'm going to stay with that. That works for me and I believe in that. However, I'm not going to truly know if this book has hit the mark until it gets out there. And if the book does bomb, uh, I can tell you I won't be ecstatically happy. However... Um, I will learn from it and I will take those, uh, those critical reviews and I will go through them and see if there's merit in there. And then when I write my next book, because now that I'm doing it once, it's kind of addicting. I'm going to do it again. Uh, I am going to pay attention to what maybe went wrong with the first and how I can do the second better. And that's all we can do. So this question of do you have what it takes, I don't know. You don't know. But you have to put it out there. You have to get over the fear. You have to get over the resistance. And you just have to let the public decide. It's ultimately up to them. Um, one of the greatest pieces of advice I ever heard, and I, I tell this to people uh, before they go out on a performance. And, and when people tell me, you know what, I'm, I'm feeling stage fright, I'm feeling nervousness. And I tell this to myself as well, because I've certainly been in circumstances as a voice educator where I've uh, walked out, um, I'm doing a master class somewhere and someone will tell me, oh, there's so-and-so from the, the local university or a voice teacher from there. And my brain starts to worry about, oh my gosh, am, am I going to be judged? And, and you, you go into the self-criticism. And so I have to stop. And I tell myself, or actually what I do is I give the audience permission to not like me. It is okay for you to not like anything that I'm saying because it's your right. And I acknowledge it's your right. And I'm not going to worry about that. I'm just going to go out and do what I do. And you, you have the right to like it or not like it. And when you let go of trying to control something you can't control, there's a lot of freedom in that. And if you are coming to voice just for the sheer joy of it, just to explore, to see what you are maybe capable of, then there's even less of a hurdle. There, there's, do you have what it takes? My gosh, everybody has what it takes. Do you have something to say? Is there something you want to express? Uh, just today, I was listening to um, Dire Straits and Sultans of Swing and Mark Knopfler, just, just an amazingly expressive guitarist. But as a vocal technician, oh, there's not much there. He doesn't have these soaring high notes or this wonderful, pleasing tone or spinning vibrato or all of these things that we voice teachers obsess over. But my gosh, he's wonderful in that song because he perfectly expresses what he wants to say. And he built the song around his vocal style. So he has what it takes. Now, if you wanted to uh, audition for the Metropolitan Opera, he doesn't have what it takes. But in what he created, he absolutely does. And if you just want to sing at your daughter's wedding or go to karaoke with friends and feel a little more confident, then absolutely. Um, I have people where it just becomes their passion and their escape. And they, they work these very um, highly technical, high-profile jobs, um, 
that are very stressful and, and take a lot of focus and concentration. So music just becomes this wonderful way to let go and immerse themselves in the freedom of expression. So if you ask, do I have what it takes? Then the answer is yes. The answer is always yes. You have what it takes. I can't control how others will accept what you have, but you have it. And there I will end the sermon. Hey, thank you so much for spending this time with me. If you want to learn more about me and my various programs, go to johnhenney.com. If you're interested in lessons, you can fill out a little form there. You can also always reach out to front desk at johnhenney.com. I always enjoy working with listeners of this podcast. Uh, it's a funny thing. If you like listening to me babble, then uh, we seem to click. So go check that out. Please share this podcast uh, with your friends if you want to help. That's the best way you can help. Uh, share it on social media. Tell people about it. I love to uh, see the audience grow. I really want to help people with this podcast. And a number of you have reached out and said it is really helpful. So if you can spread the word, I would most appreciate it. And until next time, to better singing. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>